I don't normally take commissions, but we have some very dear family friends. They had a barn that belonged to them. It's been in the family for well over a hundred years. And unfortunately, over time, the barn has started to kind of fall apart. And we had a bad wind event and a lot of the barn came down and the rest needed to be taken down so that it wasn't dangerous. Now I've been in contact with the mother of the family and the rest of the family does not know about this, but she's been talking with me about making some pins for her husband and her children and a few other family members. And that's what I'm gonna do today. I've got a beautiful piece of barn wood here and I've got 10 pin kits and one seam ripper and we are going to make some gorgeous pins out of this old barn wood. I started out by measuring all of the tubes in all of the kits that I'm gonna be making and it came to a total of 41.75 inches. Measuring from here to here, I'm looking at 26 inches. So if I cut a three quarter inch slice from this side of the board and a three quarter inch slice from this side of the board, that should give me enough material to make all of the blanks that I need. I brought my fence over. I've got it set just a hair over three quarters of an inch from uh, the blade. And we're gonna cut two slices off this slab of wood. I took each of my kits and I pulled the tubes out of them, laid them on the long stick of wood, marked the tube and labeled it with a letter. I put the corresponding letter on each bag. That way I can easily match my blanks up with the kit they belong to. We're gonna get this over to the bandsaw and we're gonna cut each of our blanks from the master blank. Here's a quick shot of all of the blanks. And at this point, you might be thinking, well, next step is to go ahead and drill the holes down the middle of the blanks and get the tubes glued in. Not quite. This was barn wood. It's been outside for well over a hundred years. This wood probably has a reasonable level of moisture in it. So what we're gonna do is document all of the wood. We're gonna weigh each piece. We'll put it in a toaster oven and we're gonna bake it for a while. We will remove from the toaster oven, we'll weigh it again, and we'll continue to cook and weigh until the weight of the wood stops decreasing. Once the weight stabilizes, we know that we've cooked all of the moisture out of the wood, then we'll be ready to drill and glue tubes. I have this nice little gram scale here. I weighed each blank and I've documented its current weight. I've got them on the tray. My toaster oven is heating up to 150 degrees right now and I have set the timer for 30 minutes. We're gonna let these blanks cook, and then we're gonna reweigh them. If you take a look inside of there, you can see the dark areas on the blank. That's a little bit of grain, but you can also see some moisture rising to the surface. This is where a lot of people get into trouble. They find a great piece of wood in grandma's backyard, and they think, hey, I'm gonna turn a pin, something really nice as a gift for grandma, and they turn this damp wood and one of a couple things will happen. One thing is, once you thin the wood down on the tube, it will start to dry very quickly and it will crack and your pin will literally crack away from the tube. The other issue is, I get a lot of people that say, hey, you know, my CA finish is foggy. When you do a CA finish, especially if you use activator, it cures the outside of the blank first. The CA below the surface hasn't quite cured yet it's gonna cure a lot slower because it didn't come in contact with the activator directly, but it boils as it cures. That boiling causes the water to evaporate from your blank and it turns into steam. That steam attempts to leave the blank, but the outer layer of CA has already cured and it gets trapped below that outer layer and you get a blank that has a nice cloudy effect. So drying your wood, if you cut your own wood is important. When you purchase wood, it's always good to make sure that it's kiln dried. The blanks just finished their first 30 minutes in the oven. And you can take a look at the list and see that each blank lost a little bit of weight. We're gonna stick them back in for another 30 minutes and see what happens. I finally reached the point where my blanks aren't losing weight anymore. They may bounce up or down maybe a 10th of a gram, but they're staying pretty well at the same weight. So I've gone ahead and I've bumped the temperature up in the oven to about 220 degrees. I'm gonna give them one more 30 minute cycle 
I finally have cooked these blanks enough where I'm comfortable in saying that they are sufficiently dry enough to be drilled, tubed, and turned. The little marks on the end that I initially thought were moisture marks, I think are more resin than anything. And one of the reasons why I say that is if you look at the door to my oven, notice how it's got this sort of a haze on it. Um, that wasn't like that when I started. And it's tacky. It's a little bit tacky to the touch. I went through all of the pin kits and I made a note of what size drill bit they use. What I'm gonna do now is get the tubes associated with the blanks, and we're gonna get them put together in groups of eight millimeter, seven millimeter, and 27 64 inch blanks so that we can begin the drilling process. I have my blanks laid out and ready to begin drilling. These two columns here are the eight millimeter blanks. I've got the seven millimeters here. This is the 27 64 and this is my one spare blank in the event we need to uh, do a repair to one of the pins. These are our eight millimeter blanks, and we need to go ahead and find the center of each of the blanks and get it marked so that we can drill properly down the center of the blanks. I'll finish marking them and we'll head over to the drill press. I have all of my blanks drilled. I've got the tubes just setting in them and we are ready to move on to gluing those tubes into the blanks. We need to scuff each of our tubes so that the epoxy will stick to the tube. I'm gonna go through and get all of these scuffed and we'll come back and start gluing. Before we glue the tubes into the blanks, we need to plug the ends so that the glue doesn't get into the tubes. For that, we just use a little bit of Play-Doh. I use a two-part epoxy, and we're just gonna mix that up. And we spread it on our tubes as evenly as we can. And we insert the tubes into the blanks, rotating them, and we'll pull them out just a little bit and slide them back in to evenly spread that epoxy throughout the blank. And that's why we're using the Play-Doh, because when we do this, the tube will actually scrape the epoxy off the interior surface of the blank, and the tube will fill up with epoxy, which makes it very difficult to turn the pins. Before we push the tube all the way into the pin, I'm going to go ahead and clean off the excess epoxy. And we'll press it just down to where it's slightly below the surface. This is the end. You can see the X that I drew to find the center of my blank, and you can see there's some excess material there. Uh, we always leave a little extra material on the end of the blank uh, because when we drill the hole, there is a possibility as the bit goes into the hole and then is pulled out of the hole to remove the chips from the bit that this hole could actually be a little wider on the entry end of the blank. So we insert the tube from the exit hole and make it flush with the blank or just slightly below flush, and we get a really nice glue up. I'm gonna set these blanks aside, let them dry overnight, and we'll go ahead and get the rest of our blanks glued up and ready to be turned. I have the tubes glued into all of the blanks. I'm gonna let them set for 24 hours so the epoxy can fully cure. The epoxy has had 24 hours to dry. We're gonna remove the Play-Doh plugs from the blanks, and then at the disc sander, we're gonna square them to the tubes. When we cut our blanks, we made each one of them about an eighth of an inch longer than we need it. You can see the tube just inside of the blank. What we need to do is remove that excess material and we need to sand this blank right down level to the surface of the tube. We're gonna clean the sanding dust out of the tube so that we don't have any issues aligning these tubes on our bushings. And if we take a closer look, you can see the brass tube right up against the edge of the blank. This blank is perfectly squared and ready to be turned. Now we're gonna go ahead and focus on getting all of the rest of the blanks ready for the turning process. Once I got all of my blanks squared on the disc sander, I went ahead and put them back with their respective kits and I gathered up the bushings that I need to turn each. 
We're now ready to move to the lathe and begin turning our blanks. I have my first blank on the lathe. This is blank A, which is the seam ripper blank. I'm going to turn this blank, and what I do to this blank is exactly what I'm going to do to every other blank. So we're only going to show the turning of one of the blanks. For this blank, I'm not going to turn down to the bushing. I'm going to leave the blank way shy of the bushing, and we're going to turn each corner down and just sort of round it over. This will give the hand something to grip onto uh, when you're using the seam ripper. With the pins, we'll go ahead and turn all the way down to the bushings. I've got the blank turned down to the shape I want. It's now time for me to start sanding and making sure we remove any tool marks that might be left in the blank. I begin sanding the blank with 220 grit sandpaper to remove the tool marks. And then I sand it from end to end following the grain to eliminate any centrifugal scratches that that may have caused. I'm going to follow up with 320 and then 400 grit and we'll come back and take a look at the blank. I finished sanding with 400 grit and the blank looks really nice. These darker areas, that's just weathering. This is old, old wood and uh, you see that a lot of times in barn wood. I really love the shape. I love how it feels. Let's get it off of these turning bushings onto some non-stick bushings and we'll put a finish on it. We'll start by cleaning with the grain using a little denatured alcohol. Then we'll start the lathe up. Now we're going to let this spin until all the denatured alcohol evaporates and we'll be ready to put a finish on our blank. We are ready to begin applying our CA finish. First coat going on. Take a look at that. This is going to be a gorgeous blank. That's some beautiful wood. I'm going to shut the camera off. We will put four more coats of thin CA on the blank. We'll follow that up with five coats of medium, and then we'll come back and look at the blank right before I begin micro meshing. I just finished applying the CA. I need to get the blank off of these nonstick bushings. We'll get it back on the turning bushings. Then we'll micro mesh to remove any of the orange peel effect left by the CA. I removed the nonstick bushings from my blank and I brought it over here to my disc sander. As we were putting the CA on, when we get to the end, the CA rolls over the end of the blank and it leaves a rough edge on both ends. On the disc sander, we're going to clean that up and re-square the blank to the tube so that the components fit nicely against the blank. Since we just sanded both ends of the blank, it is raw wood. I'm going to put just a little bit of CA on the each end to protect it and help keep moisture out. We'll let that sit here and dry for a few minutes. Then we'll come back and micro mesh our blank. Micro meshing involves using a series of nine pads that range in grit from 1200 to 20,000. And instead of sanding, these pads actually are used for polishing. 
and that polishing will remove any orange peel effect the CA might have left on the blank. The pads are dipped in water to help keep the heat and the dust down. After micro meshing, you can see that the blank looks absolutely amazing. But there's a little bit more we need to do. We're going to apply some wax to this blank and then we're going to buff it. What a beautiful blank. Just look at the color. Isn't that gorgeous? And what a great piece of family history. I want to let you know that what we just did to get this blank to this point, we're going to repeat those steps off camera for each remaining blank. Assembling the seam ripper is rather straightforward. We're going to take the cap and we'll insert it into the clip and we'll put that on the back of our blank. Make sure everything is aligned nicely. We take the spring and we roll it up Then we put it into the end of the blank and push it all the way in. And now we can insert our ripper. I have all of my blanks turned. The seam ripper is completely finished. We had one small issue. The blank that had the knot in it, the knot turned away, but there was a weak spot behind it and it literally blew out. That's not gonna be an issue because you'll remember we had one extra blank piece left. So we'll get this one drilled and we'll get the tube put in it and we should be able to turn that one tomorrow. This is a designer twist ink pen. I have made these before on the channel, but it's been a while. I'm gonna use this. This is a turn between center seven millimeter adapter that lets you use any seven millimeter bushing uh, as turn between center. And I'm gonna use it as the um, press bushing so that I don't damage the end of the blank. I need to install this brass threaded insert into the cap end. We're ready to press. I have a rubber disc on my RAM so that it doesn't damage my pins. And because of that, I wasn't able to press this little brass insert flush with the pin. And here's how I handle that. I'll go ahead and attach the clip and the cap. And we'll tighten them down as tight as we can get them. And you see the gap there between the uh, clip and the uh, blank. That's what we're worried about, but it's not gonna be an issue. We'll go ahead and finish pressing the pin. Now everything fits nice and flush. We're gonna start by pressing the nib into the body of the pin. Now we want to insert the transmission. Pressing the transmission into the pin kit is where a lot of people get into trouble. You've got this little brass end on the transmission and then you've got this little line right here on the chrome piece of the transmission. And they recommend in the instructions that you press that right up to the end of the blank. I don't like to do that. I like to stop a little bit shy and I like to test the ink refill to make sure I get the best possible fit of the transmission. So let's go ahead and just press it to the end of the brass tube. Should go in nice and easy. And we're going to stop right there, just shy of the brass tube. Now we're going to go ahead and insert our ink refill. I'm going to back the transmission off. I'm going to take it forward. And you can see, you can watch the black tip of the refill going in and out of the pen, but it's not extending out of the nib, which means we need to press it a little farther into the pin blank.
nice extension. It extracts nicely. Let's go ahead and finish assembling the pin. We're going to drop the chrome ring on. Now, the chrome ring has a little bit of an insert or an indent on this side. That goes over the lower half of the pin, and the upper half of the pin snaps right into there, and we've got a really nice pin. This is the Tetra Stylus pin. I'm just going to check that the ring matches nicely with the end of the blank. And now we'll go ahead and press the nib into the body of the pin. We've got this nice little piece on the back of the pin. Uh, this allows us to thread the transmission into the pin. And you'll notice there are two little rings on here. We want to alternate them with a gold one in the middle and the chrome one on the outside so it matches nicely. We'll slide this into the opposite end of our pin. There we go. Nice little fit. We'll grab our spring, put it onto the refill. Refill goes into the pin. And then the transmission can be threaded on. And I really like these transmissions because you can turn them all the way left or all the way right. They insert and retract regardless of which way you turn the transmission. And I kind of like that. To assemble the cap section of the blank, we had to make a little press block. Now this is a 5 16 inch hole drilled roughly a quarter of an inch into this block of wood. And we're going to use that. We'll take the clip off and we'll take the ring off. We're going to use that to press the stylus into the back of our pen. We're going to be really careful with this because we don't want to press too far. We want to make sure we press just enough for the stylus to, to um, extend past the end of the pen but not so far that, you know, it doesn't look right. You know, you could press too far if you're not careful. Just give it a little bit of a press, and then we're going to stop. We're going to evaluate. You can see it hasn't come through the end of the pin yet. That's fine. I think it's going to take multiple presses to make this happen. You just want to take your time and not get in a hurry. Starting to extend past the end of the cap piece. We're getting close. Just another little press. Eh, a little bit more. A little bit more. But this is where you want to be really careful. There we go. I think that looks really nice. Now we're going to use the block once again to press the end of the pin or, or the cap section of the pin into the cap into the cap blank. We put our trim ring on here and we've put our clip on. Now we're going to slide that into the blank. Using the same block, we'll just line everything up and then we can press the cap section into the back of the pin. Now we will assemble the two halves. And we have a really nice pin. This is a trim line pin kit. We're going to start by inserting the nib in the body blank. Now we're going to insert our transmission into the back half of the body blank, and we want to be really careful not to press it too far into the blank. We're going to go almost to the end of the brass, and then we'll test. We can see the ball of the refill right at the end of the nib, so we need to press a little farther into the pin. That looks really nice. Go ahead and slide our trim ring onto the lower half of the pin. 
Now we want to insert the cap through the clip. We'll drop that into the cap section of the pin and press it into place. Press our two halves together. And we have a really nice pin. This is the Sierra style click pin. And to assemble it, we're gonna start with this little brass ring. It's threaded on the inside and it's going to allow the nib of our pin to thread into the body of the pin. We'll use a bushing on the back to protect the, sh the pin shoulder. And you want to make sure you get that little uh, ring as flush with the end of your tube as possible. Next up, we need to insert the click mechanism into the back of the pin. And I've made this little block with a 5 16 inch hole in it, eh, about a quarter of an inch deep, maybe a little deeper. And that's to protect the plunger because if I press against the plunger, I can actually force it into the pin and then the pin will not operate properly. This is allowing me to press along the shoulder of the cap. go that looks nice we'll drop the refill into the body of the pin put the spring on the refill now we should be able to thread our nib and we've got a really nice click pin once finished the classic twist pin requires one additional step prior to assembly what we do is flip our bushing around and the narrow end of the bushing becomes the tenon diameter. And here's a cap that I've already done. We're gonna cut a tenon just like this. This tenon supports a trim ring. And then here's the base or the body of the pin. It will slide in and you want it to slide in just far enough to hide the top of the uh, transmission. And that's what she'll look like. We'll end up gluing this uh, trim ring onto the cap once we're completely finished. Let's go ahead and turn the tenon on this final blank. Since I have a known working blank with a perfect tenon, I'm gonna use it to help me measure this tenon. I had to kind of guess on the first one. Okay, now we'll fire the lathe up and we'll complete the line all the way around the blank and we're ready to begin cutting our tenon. I'm gonna use a parting tool and just very carefully Take away material. I stopped just proud of the bushing. I've got some 220 grit sandpaper and we're going to sand away the final material to make this tenon equal to the diameter of this bushing. Let's do a quick test fit. Here's our trim ring. Very nice fit. There's no play, so we did a good job getting it down to size. We'll snap our body blank in. Transmission operates nicely. All that's left is to glue this trim ring to the cap blank. We're ready to glue our trim ring onto our cap blank. Taking a look at the trim ring, you'll see that this side is flat and this side is curved. So that tells me that the flat side goes toward the blank. We're gonna use CA glue for the glue up. And whenever you glue a component onto a pin, never put the glue onto the tenon. Because if you do, when you slide the component on, it's gonna squish that glue back and it's gonna ooze out the edge of your, uh, between your component and your pin. And then you're gonna have to clean up, which could result in smearing CA on the component or the pin, and it could be unsightly. I always recommend putting the CA inside of the component. Do not get crazy and glob it in there. Put just what you need. The way I like to do that is I like to use matchsticks. 
They're very inexpensive and they're very small, so they're easy to operate with. And I just put a dot on the end of the matchstick. And then I just roll it right around the inside of my component. Making sure I get it all the way around. And I'm probably going to put just a little bit because there's not much left on the stick, but out on the edge. Now let me lay this aside. We'll seat our tenon and our trim ring together. And I'm going to use a clamp, and you do not need to gorilla this. It does not need a whole bunch of clamping pressure. Just enough to hold it in the clamp, set it aside, and let that CA cure for a while. The trim ring on our classic twist pin has had plenty of time to dry, and we're ready to finish assembly. We're going to put this little threaded grommet in the back end, and it has a line on this end of the blank where it's tapered. So we'll put that into the back of the pin. I'm going to use the turning bushing to protect. I don't want to press against my trim ring, take a chance of damaging it. We're going to press that little grommet in flush with the top of the pin. Now we will thread the cap through the clip. Squeeze that as tight as we can. And our cap is complete. Let's take care of the front half of the pin. We're going to start with the nib and make sure your trim ring is on the nib. It's very easy to forget that. I've done it before. And then you have to knock the pin apart to replace the trim ring. Very carefully press that together. There we go. Got a nice fit. Next up, we've got this little connector. It's got threads on one end. That's for the transmission. So the other end is tapered to fit into the back half of the body blank. I'm putting the threads against my pad because I want to protect them as much as possible. If you want to go one step further, you could always take a small block of wood and drill a hole large enough to accommodate the threads um, that you could put over the threads to press the uh, pin together. We'll slide the spring onto our refill. We'll put that into the pin. Thread our transmission on. Just need to remove the ball off the end of the pin. There we go. What a nice pin. That's a beaut. I would like to thank you for joining me for this video, and I want to send out a very special thank you to the family for allowing me to be a part of helping them preserve a small piece of their family history. I want everyone to know that you are always welcome in my shop. Come back and see me again very soon, and have a wonderful evening.